Hey boys and girls, welcome to our celebration of the joyous and magnanimous Flip Day. Remember, since it is a video and maybe things go by a little too quickly, unlike real life, another thing that's better about the Flip Class Lecture is you can pause it, you can rewind it, you can play it again and again, and it's always there anytime. You can even watch it the day before the test. So we are talking about biomes a little bit more. And the biome, being a just ridiculously large ecosystem, is made out of our two factors. We have our biotic factors, which are the living factors, and the abiotic factors. Now, most of the time when people think about biomes, they're thinking about the biotic factors. They're focused on what lives there, what sorts of cute animals there would be, are there fun plants, stuff like that. But what they don't usually realize is that the abiotic factors are really the most important part of any environment. It's that non-living component that really controls what's possible for the life. Now, there's some interaction. Biotic factors can affect the abiotic factors, but the abiotic factors are what are really crucial, and that's why, like, you hear environmentalists say, like, oh, we have to protect, like, temperature and climate, and we have to, like, make sure there's not a lot of pollution and stuff like that. It's because the abiotic factors are what determine what life is possible. So here's a map of the world, and it is showing you the different biomes that are possible. Now, just as a quick review before we go too much farther, this right here, that's a line of longitude going up and down, and the lines of latitude are the ones that go east to west, just like the rungs of a ladder. So you have the equator, which is right here, that is zero. You can move north of the equator, you can move south of the equator along the lines of latitude, just like you would climb up and down a ladder along the rungs. So we're looking here and you can see that one of the main components of any biome appears to be latitude. I mean, you've got these areas here. This one, you're a little liberal on the tundra here, but it should be sort of like that. You've pretty much got these areas of latitude that are determining what kinds of things you have. I mean, even look over here, it's almost like split perfectly, like, oh, look at that. Right in the tropics, got some equator action, separate a little bit more. And for the most part, latitude plays a big role because what latitude does is that controls how much sunlight is available. The closest to the equator and to a little bit north and south of the equator, the equator is here, uh, 30 north and 30 south of the equator. That is the zone called the tropics. And inside the tropics is where most of the sunlight goes. Tropics. All in this area here. The farther outside the tropics you go, the less light you have available to you. And so you can see some areas, for example, farther away from the equator up here in the northern regions. I mean, they have polar ice caps. That's just a big old glacier. Nobody lives there, so Greenland's happy about that. It's an isolationist. And you can see the tundra is fairly far up north. Now, they're not showing you Antarctica, which would be down here, is also uh, all tundra and glaciers and ice caps. So the farther you get, you have less solar energy, you have less heat, essentially. And so that what's really makes a difference between like your uh, coniferous forest, which is going to be primarily softwoods, and your deciduous forest, which can, will be primarily hardwood trees. Now, some of you guys are probably noticing another situation where you've got grass man hanging out over here in the grasslands. Over here on the same line of latitude, we have more grasslands. That brings us to the other very important component. The other very important component is amount of moisture available. And so proximity to major bodies of water such as, oh, I don't know, the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean plays a major role. And so you'll see areas that are closer get more moisture. Areas that are farther away, uh, like the grasslands as you move inward from the Pacific Ocean, they have less moisture, so they're not able to grow the trees. They just they don't have the moisture for it, so instead they're stuck in grassman territory. Now you may notice over here you've got some desert, and you also have some grassland that is closer to the Pacific Ocean than some parts of the deciduous forest to the Atlantic Ocean. The reason is you've got these mountains right in this area here that are blocking 
that from happening. And same thing over in here, you have more mountain ranges that are over in these parts of the world, like the Himalayas uh, up here in India. The Himalayas, well, there it is, really cuts off a lot of this, making it grassland and really almost, uh, th this is a really dry, dry grassland over here in this region. I mean, this is basically a big dry plateau. And in the wintertime, it's really a lot more like a tundra. In addition to that, you probably have noticed that Africa just gets all kinds of crazy. And that's because Africa has these really aggressive nastinesses coming all up in here. They're called ocean currents, just distributing a lot of dry air and a lot of heat that's really robbing it of areas that should be tropical rainforests, like down here in the Congo. But instead of being tropical rainforests, they're grassland, they're dry forests, they're desert-like. Another fun thing you can do is play around with Google Earth. We do have it installed in the computer lab. And the file that, I've tw that I'll tweet out and will be in the description of this video is actually a file that'll let you see all the biomes of the world, like this. So in order to activate that, in case you missed it, you come over here under your places, you select terrestrial biomes. Ignore all the my places, you may or may not have any, but you want to select terrestrial biomes. You want to make sure you put the legend up so you know what the colors mean, and if you don't put the levels, then you won't see the biomes. In addition to that, the only thing you need layered over here are your borders and labels. If you have any of this other stuff, it's going to look really crazy. Now the final thing that will help you navigate the earth because you'll notice that the earth when you tilt it and move it around does all kinds of crazy weirdness. Go up to view, select overview map, go back up to view and select grid. And that's going to give you your lines of longitude and latitude. It's even going to label the tropics and the equator for you so you can see when you move around the globe you can see all the really really warm type ecosystems are all in the tropics and all the colder ecosystems are up here in the northern part really far away from the tropics the farther you get up here and the farther you get down here just the worse off it is so go ahead and play around with this there'll be some questions to answer and if you're going through and you're moving the earth and you're like oh no it's sideways if you hit the N key N for north just go ahead and hit it on the keyboard it will actually go ahead and uh, you know the earth look not quite so crappy. So one of the things you do want to use Google Earth for is use it to find longitude and latitude. You'll notice that if I just hover my mouse over right here down in the corner you can actually see the longitude and latitude just above the earth. Now that's really useful because what I want to have happen is I want to sort all the biomes out in the hallway, all our posters and everything. I want to sort those biomes in order of increasing distance from the equator. So I want zero to be the ones closest to the equator, and then the ones farther down the hall will be the ones farther from the equator. And we're going to see something uh, kind of fun when we do that. Now the final part of making anything about a biome and thinking about climate is we have these things called climatograms, which really do a good job of showing you uh, the two main abiotic factors that matter. They show you the amount of solar energy, the temperature, and they also show you the amount of moisture, thus the rainfall. So this is what we would call a climatogram. So they all look a little different. Even though they're all technically for savanna grassland biomes, you'll see you've got a lot of variation depending on what type of grassland we're actually looking at. Now you notice all the climatograms all have the same pattern. We'll look at this one here for Barra. Got on the left side they've got the temperature in degrees Celsius and on the right side we've got rainfall in millimeters. Uh, you want to keep it nice and clean and metric and they've actually they have their colors switched because the uh, the bars always show the precipitation which should be blue and then <laughs> the line shows the temperature which should be red. So if we look up at the San Fernando, you can actually see a nice interplay. You've got pretty much even rain, which is a very common feature of all the grasslands. They're not usually very wet. And you see the temperature almost goes like ours, colder in January, colder in December, warmer in the middle of the month. And again, your axes showing you temperature on this side and showing you rainfall over here on this side. And so what I'm going to have you guys do is I'm going to have you make these. Luckily we pretty much know the locations. If you forget, Google Earth it up. So I'm going to have you guys make your climatograms in Excel like I've made mine here. Now to set up your climatograms we need to have a little discussion. Remember these are the columns. 
these are the rows, right? Columnar columns go up and down. So to make this chromatogram, it's actually really, really easy to do. I'm going to walk you through how I made this one for Mount Vernon. So you have your fresh spreadsheet, and it makes your life a lot easier if you put some titles up here in the top. All right, here I have my titles, and it makes it really easy if you set it up exactly this way. You don't have to, but you know, you're making life harder if you don't. So you do your month, rain, temperature, and then across here you just put the months. Just the first letter will work January through December. So once you have that, then it's time to get that data. One of the websites I have for you over here is called Weatherbase. It's kind of a cool website. Uh, what I like to do is zoom way, way out so you can actually get a good look at the world and then pick an area to zoom into. So here we are with the world, and you can just scroll in just like on all the other Google Maps. Find ourselves Mount Vernon. So there's Mount Vernon, and you just click on it, Mount Vernon, Ohio and it will think about things for a little bit and then give you the flag you click on the flag the name Mount Vernon Ohio and then it's going to show you a nice weather summary and this has way more info than we would ever need we essentially need just the average rainfall average precipitation make sure your units up here are in C for Celsius keep it nice and clean and metric kids and it's really easy if you do rain first and you can just select the amounts because we already have our titles populated and just be real careful when you go through before you hit copy which is control C on the keyboard just make sure you know you only have that data selected nothing else so control C move on over we've got rainfall click on January put it in it should line up perfectly if it doesn't line up perfectly if it's got an extra one hanging over the side you may have chosen the annual so make sure you don't do the annual next we're going to do the average temperature per month we don't want the high temperature we want the average temperature because we just want a ballpark of what it's like so you select that again very carefully control C for copy make sure that you just have the data come over here put it right in there for the temperature and now it's time to make our graph so you just select everything right there go to insert line graph right up here we're going to do the old double line graph there it is now you notice it already made the colors real nice for you rain is blue temperature is red that's why we did it in that order because otherwise uh, you have to go through and fix the colors so once you have that set up then you'll notice it doesn't look very chromatogrammy. We've got one axis, we've got two lines. I know, it's scary. So you click on the blue for the rainfall. And then you just go up here, change chart type. It's on the design ribbon. Change chart type. Click a Rooney. Pick column graph. Column graph is the vertical bar graph. And now we're looking a little better, except you'll notice our axes are still all crazy. We've got temperature over here, and but the rain doesn't have one over here. That's okay. Right click again on your rain. Go to format data series. It'll pop up this one. Just check the box right here for secondary axis. Hit close. Bob's your uncle. We're looking pretty good. Next, we need to go into the ribbon again. Click on layout so you can add titles, etc., and make it a proper graph. Thanks for watching, everybody.